Uh, okay, uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Martina Badi, who is here, and Chu Young Goldfellow, and Brandon McMahon, uh, Kunal, and Li Zheng. Um, machine learning, uh, thanks in part to, due to recent improvements uh, in uh, deep learning, is really transforming our world. Uh, from uh, text, and speech, uh, spe text and speech recognition, to self-driving cars, to gaming, to even fashion, uh, these areas are advancing by leaps and bounds. Uh, the cycle of innovation uh, drives this uh, amazing feedback, si uh, feedback um, positive feedback loop, where uh, 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 customers uh, motivated by increased, by high utility of applications, uh, share more and more data with their devices and computing platforms, who in turn become more powerful and useful to end consumers. As uh, the shared data is becoming uh, more personalized and sensitive, it's upon us, uh, security researchers, to give uh, the training data protection it deserves. And of course, I take it for granted that we are going to apply and use uh, industry's best practices in data encryption, data retention, access control. But none of these techniques answer the question of, of what, uh, what the models themselves, their parameters, their outputs, reveal about the underlying training, da training data. And uh, this is a standard pipeline for a machine learning task where training data is used uh, to uh, fit a model that is then used by inference engine to make predictions. Even though we might only care about privacy of the predictions that users see, an adversary is uh, generally able to feed its own inputs into the inference engine. Uh, in, uh, it may even get its hands on, on the model itself if it's shipped to end user devices. So our best bet uh, to protect privacy of training data is ensuring that the model itself is privacy preserving. And uh, the focus of this talk is going to be on this transformation of taking training data uh, and uh, uh, fitting a model that uh, preserves its privacy. And here I, would, uh, I want to call out uh, what I term a uh, privacy learning uh, or machine learning privacy fallacy that you can hear from, uh, 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 from machine learning researchers or data scientists uh, who would say that uh, a, a well-trained machine learning model would preserve privacy of underlying training data because, well, it's good, it's trained on massive amount of data, um, and uh, uh, I won't challenge uh, this uh, uh, belief, uh, and these are reasons why I believe, uh, I, I think that this is actually wrong in many important cases. So first, there are examples of good quality machine learning models that just fail to protect privacy. Uh, one example would be a uh, recommend, recommender engi engine based on user-to-user -user similarities. If an adversary is able to come up with a profile that uh, suffi comes sufficiently close to yours, the system uh, will happily fill in the gaps if it is based on user-to-user -user similarities. Support, support vector, uh, vector machines. It's a well-known machine learning technique that by design and explicitly includes as part of its model uh, records from, from the original uh, uh, data set. Then models can be very large, can, be, can uh, include uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of uh, high accuracy parameters. And I challenge anyone to argue that uh, these models protect privacy of underlying data. And the burden of proof must be on people who make such claims. And there's also empirical evidence to uh, uh, the risks that presented by machine learning, uh, machine learning models. Uh, there was a paper from last year, CCS, that uh, demonstrated, that extracted um, uh, images from a face recognition system that looks suspicious like, an image, uh, like images from the underlying, underlying training data set. Uh, there's a very recent work by Shocker and others out of Cornell Tech uh, that uh, demonstrated a powerful membership inference attack 
on the machine learning system. Uh, so um, before uh, we uh, think about ways of doing machine learning with privacy, let's understand uh, how it's done without privacy. So this is a very uh, rough uh, recipe for, uh, uh, for the pipeline for deep learning training. So we have to pick a loss function, the function that we want to optimize. Uh, we take account of available training uh, and test data sets. Uh, we choose the topology of the network. Uh, we select the training algorithm and uh, uh, we decide on the hyperparameters such as the stopping rule or the learning rate and we run it to completion. In this work, we'll be using softmax loss, which is a differentiable proxy for the accuracy of the classifiers we want to train. Uh, the training and test data sets are going to be two standard uh, uh, data sets used in machine learning, which I'll introduce in a few slides. But it's important to, no to note that the, that the yardstick by which we measure our, our progress is uh, existed prior to our, our work. So uh, we keep ourselves honest by comparing ourselves to uh, existing uh, to, prior, uh, to prior art. Uh, for the topology of the network, we'll be using uh, uh, layered neural networks. And this is an example of one. We'll be using uh, a fairly deep neural network. We'll be using a much shallower network that consists of just a few layers. Uh, the training algorithm is going to be a stochastic gradient descent, which I'll explain over the next few slides. So the plain gradient descent optimizes or minimizes a loss function by starting somewhere on the parameter plane and then uh, uh, updating the parameters in the direction where the loss function uh, decreases the steepest. Algorithmically, uh, it uh, consists of computing the gradient of the function, making a step in the direction opposite of the gradient, and, uh, and do it again. Uh, computing the gradient of the loss function can be a rather expensive proposition because it requires visiting every record to the training data set, so instead, we'll be running a stochastic gradient descent, which is an approximation to the loss function, which evaluates, approximates it uh, on the small sample of the training data. Uh, so uh, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, recipe for deep learning. And as you can imagine, there's like no surprise here, our best bet of uh, endowing this with, uh, with privacy is by, uh, okay, so I hope that, uh, uh, yeah, is, by, is endowing this uh, with, uh, is, is to use differential privacy. Uh, in this work, we'll be using the epsilon delta formulation of differential privacy uh, that um, uh, states roughly that uh, the, uh, 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 the mechanisms of output on uh, database D is going to be nearly the same as the distribution of, this, uh, of, this, of the output of the same mechanism on the database D prime, where, where D and D prime differ in a single record. And this, this definition has two parameters, epsilon and delta, where epsilon quantifies information leakage and delta allows for a small probability of failure. Uh, in the language of uh, our machine learning example, uh, uh, Differential privacy states that an adversary uh, who examines output of the model uh, 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 trained on uh, two different data sets, D and D prime, can't tell uh, the, uh, whether the model came from the blue distribution trained on D, or, or sorry, from the red distribution trained, trained on D versus the blue distribution where the model came from the mechanism uh, uh, tr uh, run on D prime. A, an important mechanism that we'll be running, relying on is going to be the Gaussian mechanism that uh, approximates an arbitrary uh, function uh, uh, with a real-world output or a, a multidimensional uh, output by adding uh, a noise sample from the normal distribution where the parameter of the noise is calibrated, is selected on the basis of the uh, function's L2 sensitivity, which is defined as the maximal distance uh, of the function's output in the L2 norm uh, on uh, the adjacent databases D and D prime that 
different in a single record. So this is just a very simple recipe for uh, computing a function with differential privacy. Step one, bound the sensitivity of the function. Step two, apply a uh, Gaussian uh, additive noise mechanism. But what about functions whose sensi sensitivity we cannot really analyze? Here, a very useful property of differential, pr differential privacy comes, on, comes in useful, uh, which the property is that uh, uh, differential privacy is composable and additive. If two functions, f and d, are separately differentially private, then releasing the, the output of these functions on, this, on the same input will be uh, differentially private, and the uh, uh, privacy parameters will add up. Uh, so it suggests a uh, recipe for computing uh, for an, uh, for uh, computing uh, a composite function with differential privacy uh, that consists of uh, bounding sensitivity of the function's components, ex uh, evaluating each of the components uh, with differential privacy, for example, by uh, going through the Gaussian mechanism, and then computing the total privacy loss via a composition theorem. Now I want to merge this, like this two threads in the stock together. We want to do deep learning with differential privacy. Uh, so this is, that was our recipe for uh, deep learning. And uh, we'll be evaluating our algorithms on two data sets uh, known affectionately uh, as fruit flies of machine learning. Uh, the first data set consists of uh, handwritten digits, uh, 60,000 of them. Uh, the second data set consists of uh, 60,000 small colored images uh, uh, drawn from 10 classes such as, such as cats, dogs, airplanes, sheep. And uh, in both cases, the problem uh, uh, that we'll be solving uh, with, uh, uh, with machine learning models is classification task of correctly classifying these images. As the first step uh, in uh, adapting the existing recipe to differential privacy, differential privacy will add a uh, layer, a projective layer, that will compress uh, the, input uh, the, uh, in, in the input space by projecting to the, uh, uh, to the uh, principal components. We'll be using a principal component analysis uh, a, uh, uh, that will learn with differential privacy. Uh, then we want to adapt uh, the stochastic gradient descent to differential privacy. And just following the recipe, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, uh, achieving differential privacy of each individual step of the stochastic gradient descent. This is uh, not, uh, 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 this requires some work because uh, by itself, the gradient is not necessarily bounded. So we, uh, uh, propose an algorithm that computes uh, the, uh, the gradient together with its per example sensitivity, and if the sensitivity is too high, it will scale down the gradient, making sure that its norm doesn't, exe doesn't uh, exceed a threshold, a certain threshold. Then we'll be applying the Gaussian mechanism at each step of the, uh, uh, of the stochastic gradient descent. Uh, Finally, the hyperparameters, uh, it, seem, it looks like it's uh, the step which is, uh, uh, which is the easiest because we only have to run our uh, 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 models so many times, like a, uh, really a few dozen times, so it doesn't, it, uh, the privacy budget that we spent on this step is really minimal. And uh, the first time we uh, run a system uh, uh, with the parameters chosen on, uh, on the basis of what we knew uh, how non-private systems are uh, uh, require. So the first time we ran a system uh, until it produced, uh, uh, it achieved accuracy that was kind of decent, uh, and we computed this privacy loss, we were very disappointed. So the, uh, we achieved epsilon of, uh, of about 12,000, uh, which is, uh, uh, and remember, the uh, adverse advantage is e to, 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 to the epsilon. So we are talking about the privacy loss or the adversary's advantage of being e to 12,000, which is really a generous number. 
And it only holds, holds with probability 90%. With probability 10% can be worse. Okay, mm. so we need something stronger and indeed there are advanced composition theorems that would give us much, uh, uh, potentially would give us much better privacy laws. And I want to give you some intuition for, how, for why these advanced composition theorems work. Uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, an example of an adversary who uh, is uh, trying to decide between the blue and red distribution and it observes three samples from, uh, from one of these distributions. So he observes the first sample from the blue distribution and it's a vote for the blue distribution. It draws a second sample from the blue distribution and it's a slightly stronger vote in favor of the blue distribution than the red. It, takes, it gets a sample from the uh, blue distribution uh, in the third case and actually it's a vote for the red distribution. Uh, the standard, the naive composition theorem works even in the worst case when every single uh, uh, of the samples is a vote in the correct, correct direction. Which reminds me of the opening sequence of Rosencrantz and Gilderson are dead, where a hat lands 70, no, sorry, a coin lands uh, 78 times uh, heads in a row. Uh, and um, uh, we are, unless we are so unlikely that it happens, uh, we are in a much better world where uh, the privacy loss function behaves around like a random variable that can go up or can go down. The adversary can gain knowledge uh, or can lose, can uh, be confused. Uh, so the uh, advanced composition theorem keeps uh, applies this logic, it models the privacy loss variable as a uh, random variable. And uh, it roughly states that uh, uh, the uh, privacy budget will uh, accumulate in proportion to the square root of the number of steps. We apply advanced composition theorem and we end up with a loss of, uh, of epsilon of about 360, which is a big progress compared to 12,000, uh, 12, but still uh, uh, an unacceptab unacceptably high number, unacceptably high privacy loss. Uh, we go back to the drawing board and uh, uh, look for ways where our, our analysis is loose. And we observe that in each step of the stochastic gradient descent, uh, the algorithm only touches 1% of data. We can, we can incorporate it in, into our privacy analysis. And once we do that, we drive down the, pri the cumulative privacy loss to epsilon 10, which holds with probability 99.9%. Uh, but um, uh, we want to do better. And to do this, uh, uh, we need uh, sharper, more accurate tools for understanding the privacy loss uh, or, uh, in the long run. And uh, I uh, uh, plotted here the log of the privacy loss function for the Gaussian mechanism based on 20% sampling. And you can see from this uh, uh, plot that uh, the privacy loss drops off very quickly, but it still has a long tail. And uh, uh, to, in order to, uh, to uh, bound the privacy loss in the long run, we want to understand, we want to bound the, uh, we want to have sharp uh, uh, bounds on the tail of this distribution. And the best tools we have for doing this are uh, the higher moments of this loss function. Uh, and in the uh, contribution of this work that we consider uh, Im important to, uh, 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 to, the, uh, uh, to the area of differential privacy, uh, we propose a privacy loss accountant that keeps track of the higher moments of the privacy loss function. Once we apply uh, uh, this analysis that requ requires some uh, numerical computations, we end up with a, uh, uh, with a total privacy loss, uh, which is uh, uh, 1.25, which is below the like, industry accepted standards of, uh, that, are commonly, uh, that are used currently in Chrome or in, in Apple iOS 10. And uh, this privacy loss holds with probability uh, uh, 10 to the minus five, and we can get uh, uh, the, uh, we can, if you wanna uh, get epsilons for smaller deltas, uh, we can easily extract those from our analysis too. Uh, 
Uh, and here I want to stress the fact that, that we uh, 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 that we achieved um, a, a much smaller uh, 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 and, uh, privacy loss of the, of the entire algorithm by uh, going back and revisiting our analysis. We didn't change a single step in our original algorithm. We were we kept redoing the analysis uh, uh, by bringing insights from uh, uh, probability and algorithm uh, and algorithms. Uh, so uh, let me bring up the uh, results of, uh, of uh, our work. Um, uh, so this is the baseline uh, that we, com we are comparing ourselves with, uh, where uh, on MNIST we achieve, uh, the baseline, uh, baseline models achieve accuracy of 98.3% with no privacy. On the CIFAR-10, the colored images, uh, we've got 80% accuracy. Uh, in the prior work uh, by Shkroti, uh, Shokri, sorry, uh, from CCS last year, uh, uh, which uh, achieved accuracy on MNIST of 98%, uh, this, this prior work reported uh, absence per parameter of the model, and there are tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of these parameters, so the total cumulative pr uh, privacy loss was about 2,000. And again, we are talking about E to to the epsilon uh, in the uh, actual adversarial advantage. And in the concurrent work uh, by Wu et al, uh, they achieved a uh, uh, much more decent epsilon of two, uh, but uh, by training a convex model, which is a much more narrow class of models, and uh, their accuracy in the MNIST was 80%, a long way, long way off uh, uh, of the existing prior, of the existing um, uh, state of the art. Uh, so finally, these are our results. Uh, uh, we achieved 97% accuracy on MNIST with epsilon of eight, uh, and like it increases slightly as uh, uh, we uh, uh, turn out the privacy uh, parameters. On CFR, the gap between uh, the baseline and uh, our privacy-preserving uh, mechanisms is larger, and I invite you to try to improve our, our, on our answers, on our results. Uh, and uh, to conclude, uh, uh, we uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, 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 differential private deep learning um, uh, uh, can be uh, 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 can achieve uh, uh, reasonable uh, accuracy numbers. Uh, we uh, ran our analysis on public publicly available data sets, encouraging. Uh, 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 basically uh, bringing competition. Uh, we implemented our work in TensorFlow and open sourced our code. Uh, it required, uh, there, there were several algorithmic advances in our work and uh, they're uh, all uh, uh, shared in paper and code. Uh, there are lessons uh, if you want to do similar work that are in the full version of the paper that is available on archive. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Questions? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, great work, first. And okay, here is my question. So could you give more expl explanation, explanation on why choose Gaussian distribution instead of Laplace or exponential mechanism in noise perturbation part? Yeah, uh, so the this is a very simple question uh, because the Gaussian distribution is more concentrated. So it, uh, it gives somewhat weaker privacy guarantees because uh, uh, Gaussian distribution doesn't achieve uh, uh, pure differential privacy, but because it, if it tails drop off more quickly, then it ends up being uh, having a much smaller variance. Uh, but intuitively, it's usually the exponential mechanism can get the best uh, performance for that. Okay, so for the exponential mechanism, uh, strictly speaking, any mechanism can be cast as an exponential. So uh, by saying that uh, uh, we can uh, cast any, any differential private mechanism as an exponential mechanism. So uh, uh, exponential mechanism doesn't really narrow the space of mechanisms. Okay, thank you. More questions? 
Hi, uh, this is Xin Yixing from uh, Penn State University. Yep. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first question is, uh, I realize you use PCA uh, in front of a neural network. That's correct. And one of the big advantages for big neural, a deep neural network is like it deal with uh, high dimensional data. Yes. That is the reason it gives us uh, better performance. For PCA, when you do the dimensional reduction, uh, apparently you will see the performance drop out significantly. That is also shown in your slides. So my question is how practical this, this, this solution could be in the real world? That's my first question. So uh, uh, I uh, don't think that uh, the drop off in the, uh, compared to the baseline uh, can be attributed to, is mostly due to the PCA step. I don't think it's true. The PCA is actually, uh, on, at least on the uh, MNIST CFR data sets, doesn't lead to big drop in performance. And the PCA, uh, it's, um, uh, I think it compresses the input images by a factor of 10, uh, but uh, it's a projection to the principal components, so really kind of the information is mostly preserved by the PCA step, so I wouldn't like, roll it out completely. Yeah, my understanding is like, uh, when you deal with the minced data set, uh, is definitely include, because it's white and black, it's definitely include a lot of uh, 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 not, not quite useful data. So mm -hmm. that's the reason we'll do the dimensional reduction. Yes. We still see the performance maintained in a high uh, accuracy. But actually, when you deal with the CFR 10, maybe CFR 100, I don't know whether you did that or not. So that included a lot of uh, colorful information. We'll do the dimensional reduction. It's definitely lose a lot of useful information. That yeah, is my, my personal understanding. Okay, that's the first statement. Okay. Uh, the second question that I have is how possible this approach could apply to other deep neural network architecture like uh, RNN, recurrent neural network. I see. So uh, our hope was to, so that's an excellent question and something that is uh, on our plates. Uh, but uh, we hope that uh, this work is uh, general enough and its lessons are transferable enough to other types of neural networks. So in particular, the stochastic gradient descent, uh, it's a, uh, what we do can be generalized to all other methods that are uh, based on gradients. Uh, uh, so uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's definitely, a, uh, it might work uh, or it might require some new ideas to make it truly practical. Okay, thank you. Uh, for, uh, time for one more question. Thank you for the talk. Um, I wonder if you ran model inversion on the networks and if you have an intuition of how the results look like. Hey, sir, can you say again? If you run the, if you run the model inversion attacks by uh, Frederick Snydell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, d uh, we haven't done, uh, we haven't run the attacks themselves. Uh, uh, as uh, Frederick Snydell say, uh, uh, differential privacy is a defense against uh, their attack. Uh, so there are uh, definitely theoretical uh, bounds that you can derive that uh, show that their attack uh, only has so much, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, can recover so much. Uh, I would suspect that in practice uh, our uh, protection is stronger than we claim, uh, but we haven't run their attack. All right, let's speak again.